It's technology of the smallest kind. It's everywhere. It's in the finest grains of society. From autos to manufacturing to data centers uh, to communications, everything depends on semiconductors. Semiconductors are more important than oil. Microprocessors are a highly strategic industry. Across from China, the island of Taiwan is the world's largest producer of electronic chips, a situation that is creating geopolitical tensions. Taiwan is China. Taiwan is also being If we imagine China taking over Taiwan semiconductor industry, the worldwide economic shutdown. Taiwan uh, with semiconductor is probably the best defense, it has a, a silicon shield. Since the 1980s, the United States and Europe have been off shipping the production of electronic chips. The globalization trend was driven by differentials in labor costs. It was simply cheaper to hire workers. Aware of their dependence, Americans and Europeans are facing a race against time to produce their own chips. They're building the biggest plant they've ever built in the world here in Arizona. 18 months ago, it was desert. The country that produces microprocessors will thus control the global industry. The world's geopolitics has been defined by where the oil reserves are for the last five decades. And I think where the chips come from is more important for the next five decades. From Taiwan to the far reaches of America, microprocessors are now coveted by the major world powers. Manufacturing a microprocessor requires cutting-edge technology. And it all starts with one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. Extracted as quartz, the silicon is first melted in an oven at 1400 degrees and then cooled in silos. The material is then cut to form thin silicon wafers. The electronic circuits that form the microprocessors are etched onto these wafers. They are found in all electronic devices. In the 1980s, Europe preferred to transfer production of this technology to Asia. Taiwan decided to make it a strategic industry. It's very strong in uh, right now in technology. It's very strong in terms of uh, the talent supply, right? The, the workforce uh, quality. And uh, it has the uh, strongest, uh, I would say, semiconductor supply chain cluster with global partners. In terms of the infrastructure, cost structure, Taiwan become very promised land for this kind of stuff. The island, just off the coast of China, is the main stronghold in this strategic industry. Taiwan accounts for 30% of the world's supply of microprocessors. The small country is a vital pillar of the global economy. It owes this transformation to one man, Morris Chang. Born in China in 1931, this engineer is venerated as a national hero in Taiwan. 
对张创办人对台湾的重要的贡献，表达最高的敬意跟谢意。In 2018, Morris Chang was awarded the country's highest civilian honor by the President of the Republic. Morris Chang studied at the best American universities before becoming the founder of TSMC, the first global manufacturer of microprocessors. He is revered throughout Silicon Valley. Morris, the world is full of successful people, frankly, but we've never seen impact like what you've made. And um, on behalf of all of us, you're my hero. Thank you. Thank you. Morris Chang, I think, rightly can claim to have really reshaped the chip industry starting in the late 1980s when he founded TSMC. He was actually present at the creation of the semiconductor industry when he worked at Texas Instruments in the late 1950s. And so he's been with the chip industry from the invention. Actually, the uh, very idea, the, the new business model, uh, the pure play foundry business model, uh, now everybody uh, thinks that uh, it was a pretty clever idea. But at the time, nobody needed that platform. He, with the support of the Taiwanese government, which was a founding investor in Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, began pouring money into expanding production capacity in Taiwan, designing none of their chips in-house, but providing outsourced manufacturing for chip firms in Europe, the United States, across the world. Pretty quickly, uh, in the early 90s, uh, and I think that TSMC existence certainly helped to accelerate the formation of a lot of fabulous companies. Uh, there were maybe 25 fabulous companies in the whole world. And then 10 years later, there were 400, 500 fabulous companies. In less than 40 years, TSMC has built an empire of mega factories across Taiwan. In the suburbs of Taipei, the TSMC factories are impenetrable. Corporate communication is strict. Interviews with employees are forbidden, as are images from inside. TSMC has become the center of global attention. The company has the power to paralyze the world. TSMC produces 90% of the most advanced processor chips. From Apple, whether it's an iPhone or NVIDIA, which powers many data centers, TSMC produces many of their chips. And without TSMC's production, the entire digital economy would simply ground to a halt. Of all of the companies you know in the world, this is the only company that currently has something they make in our possession right now. There are no others. So there's basically air, and TSMC. <laughs> TSMC's stock market value constitutes over half of Taiwan's national wealth. These days, 30% of the world's electronic chips are manufactured on the island. China, the USA, and Europe are lagging far behind and have to import the bulk of their microprocessors. And in March 2020, the world economy's dependence on this technology was exacerbated by the COVID crisis. COVID was this massive accelerant. Now everybody's communicating online. Zoom became a common word, you know, not for a telescopic lens, but for how we communicate. The semiconductor industry was sort of rolling along at five or 6% kind of growth rate. And all of a sudden when COVID happened, that bounced up to demand of 20 to 25%, but it also disrupted supply chains. So the supply went negative. La crise sanitaire a été un exemple de choc, de double choc sur les chaînes d'approvisionnement, empêchant les producteurs de produire et encourageant finalement les clients à consommer davantage. 
the global pandemic created an imbalance between microprocessor supply and demand. We pushed out of our fabs 1.15 trillion chips, well exceeding any record in the past. So we've been running at way above full capacity for a couple years. The problem we're facing right now is that demand has just exploded and fabs have four walls and you can only produce so many chips within those four walls. The Western world then became aware of its vulnerability. And a chip shortage, you know, all of a sudden car manufacturing lines were stopped, economies were, you know, unable to uh, move forward. Everybody in the world realized how important chips are. We became really important overnight. In 2021 and 2022, a major company like Apple lost over $10 billion due to a shortage of microprocessors. A decline in production also meant delivery delays for all games consoles. Car manufacturers began to panic. Today, the big three announced all plants will be shut down over concerns of the coronavirus. All the plants through March 30th. In 2020, when started COVID-19, the automotive industry, the business is go on the downside. They just stop all the chip. Force company like a TSMC, give the production capacity to some other industry. So forget about automotive. So in 2020, in the uh, end of the year, he found that his demand suddenly rose. He wanted to increase the demand, but the production was not stopped. It was increasing, but it was increasing. So it became a situation of a mutual demand. All of a sudden, every country in the world wake up. Then automatic means begin to increasing their demand. Now they ask it, uh, our foundry company. We say, sorry, we don't have capacity. We don't give you capacity to somebody else. Oh, no kidding. Das Opelwerk in Eisenach stellt vorübergehend seine Produktion ein. Les salariés de Renault à Sandouville, près du Havre, à l'arrêt contraint, l'usine va devoir fermer 13 jours. Thousands of people in mid-Michigan are temporarily out of work tonight. And it's all because of a little chip. In the car parks of American automakers, tens of thousands of vehicles are waiting for their microprocessors. In 2021, many of these vehicles were not even produced yet, costing the global automotive industry around 200 billion euros. In 2022, the crisis had still not been resolved. Near Le Havre, the Renault factory in Sandouville has become silent once more. Our site is arrêté pendant 10 jours, tout simplement pour euh, cette fameuse crise des microprocesseurs. Régulièrement, malheureusement, la direction est amenée à fermer le site euh, pour manque d'approvisionnement de, de ces microprocesseurs et on se retrouve dans, bah, dans le tiers d'aujourd'hui avec une usine, euh, dans notre jargon, euh, on appelle ça une usine meurtre, c'est-à-dire euh, personne à l'intérieur. Vous voyez des voitures qui sont accrochées euh, sur des lignes de montage, mais le problème c'est qu'il n'y a plus de salariés à côté. Pour un bruit. Il ne reste plus que de la tôle. Sur 2021, on parle d'un peu plus de 60 jours d'arrêt. Plus de 60 jours d'arrêt. Donc oui, effectivement, là, c'est plus inquiétant, c'est alarmant. Imaginons-nous que Taïwan ou les pays asiatiques qui produisent ces microprocesseurs, un jour, il y a un, une crise géopolitique. Tout simplement, ils ne nous livrent plus. Vous comprenez Ils ne nous livrent plus. On parle de centaines de milliers d'emplois dans les mois, les années à venir, si on inverse pour la tendance, qui seront sacrifiés en France. Ah, C'est fermé aujourd'hui, l'usine est fermée. There's a lot of analogy to what we saw in 1973, you know. In 1973, oil was a given. Nobody worried about oil. It was always there, until it wasn't. Now we fast forward, 2020. We said, look, oh, those chips have always been there, until they weren't. And all these questions slowly pop up. Where are they, you know? Where did they come from? Who is producing it? 
This is exactly why chips and semiconductors are now strategic. The globalization trend was driven by differentials in labor costs. It was simply cheaper to hire workers uh, in places in East Asia. It was driven by typical trends in terms of shipping costs going down, in terms of new IT technologies making it easier to have a firm that operated in Europe and the US, and that's where the vulnerability comes in. On ne pensait pas un seul instant que ces chaînes d'approvisionnement internationales puissent être remises en question. On n'avait probablement pas l'imagination d'une telle pandémie ou d'une telle guerre. Et donc la logique de main d'œuvre à bas coût n'a plus aucun sens aujourd'hui. On est plus dans une logique de technologie à bas coût. Et ça, c'est fondamental pour comprendre ce mouvement inverse qu'on a pu observer. For decades, companies have massively delocalized production without a second thought. Microprocessors have been no exception. And today, Western leaders are acutely aware of their dependence. The pandemic has painfully exposed the vulnerability of chips supply chains. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed the fragility of just-in-time supply chains. I think for a couple of decades now, political leaders, meanwhile, have just not thought much about the industry. They've thought semiconductors were something that plugged into their computer or smartphone, and their thinking stopped basically right there. Nous avons sur le sujet des composants, en particulier électroniques, un énorme défi. A global semiconductor shortage has caused a shortfall on consumer goods, especially automobiles, and it's contributing to higher prices around the world. And so it's only in the past couple of years, due to the pandemic, due to the geopolitical competition, that leaders have started thinking about, is this a risk? To limit the effects of the shortage and reduce their technological dependence, America, China, and Europe are taking action. In 2022, each announced its microprocessor plan for developing their own production capacity. The College of Commissioner has adopted today the European Chips Act. The chip war has been declared. There are a couple of different wars going on simultaneously. There's wars between companies struggling for market share, but there's also competition between nations for who gets which part of the supply chain. On the 2nd of August, 2022, Taiwanese television channels broadcasted the arrival of an official airplane live on air. Nancy Pelosi was on board the then Speaker of the United States House of Representatives and third in line to the presidency. It's the first time in 25 years that such an important American political leader has set foot on Taiwanese soil. Today, our delegation came to Taiwan to make unequivocally clear we will not abandon our commitment to Taiwan and we are proud of our enduring friendship. Although Nancy Pelosi broadcasts her visit across social media, she doesn't mention anything about a very important meeting about microprocessors. Here she is with Morris Chang, founder of TSMC, and Mark Liu, the current CEO of the company. If you look at Taiwan's production of semiconductor, you can uh, easily tell that Taiwan has occupied a very important place in the world. And it might come into play in the near future that China might have the temptation to think about Taiwan's semiconductor as something that they want to take over. China wants to expand its influence and power uh, beyond the first island chain. Taiwan happens to get stuck in the way and they want to take Taiwan over. The absolute majority of the people here say no to unification. Using force becomes the only option for the Chinese government to uh, unify Taiwan. Nancy Pelosi is in Taiwan tonight, and China is already responding. Pelosi's late night landing was quickly followed by news of Chinese military drills all around the island. Using missiles and fighter jets, China organized an unprecedented military blockade of Taiwan for several days. President Xi Jinping sent a strong message to Taipei and Washington. 
我要告诉大家的是，这是一场彻头彻尾的闹剧。美方打着所谓民主的幌子，在干着侵犯中国主权的勾当，台湾必将回归祖国的历史大事。Pelosi 去台湾，我觉得 Pelosi 他的 t i s i o n 都说不上，他年龄太大了 ，too old。Since 1949, Taiwan has been one of the obsessions of the Central Powers. In October 2022, during the 20th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, President Xi Jinping reaffirmed his commitment to annex the Rebel Island. Solving Taiwan problems is Chinese's business. It must be Chinese to decide, but we will not abandon our weapons. 保留采取一切必要措施的选项。China's ambition for Taiwan is not just politically fueled. The island is at the heart of the technology war between the USA and China. La Chine a annoncé clairement son objectif de devancer les États-Unis sur le plan technologique. Il est évident que le, le conflit s'est cristallisé sur les semi-conducteurs qui sont au cœur justement de la troisième révolution industrielle et, et, et de la domination technologique du monde. S'il y avait une attaque chinoise justement militaire sur Taïwan, ça créerait une déflagration vraiment majeure. La Chine, Chine, 这个很多的工艺技术的积累，我们的能力就不是在这个行业里面要去追最先进那一点。我们把中低的，我们靠量，中低端的吃了就完了。这么一个这个问题。If we imagine the world with China taking over Taiwan semiconductor industry and they use it as a weapon against the rest of the democracies. I'm sure uh, the rest of the democracies, uh, which relied on semiconductor industry in Taiwan, I'm sure they will react in a very strong way. Taiwan uh, with semiconductor is probably the best defense. Les Taïwanais se servent de, de TSMC comme d'un bouclier et d'un moyen de se protéger au plus haut niveau, y compris sur le plan politique, mais également sur le plan militaire. Il faut que Taïwan reste intact. Dans sa capacité à produire des semi-conducteurs face à la Chine et pour l'industrie américaine et l'industrie mondiale. United States, you make sure we are here to make things for you. It's not for our interest, for their interest, for Apple, for all these companies that require our continue our business. And Chinese, they maybe like it happen, but the U.S. say no, no, sorry, we not allow this happen. An armed conflict in the Taiwan Strait could jeopardize the majority of the world's electronics production. Faced with China, Taiwan can count on a powerful military ally. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's a commitment we made. The idea that, that it could be taken by force is just not appropriate. It will dislocate the entire region and be another action similar to what happened in, in, uh, in Ukraine. Si Taïwan n'avait pas la capacité industrielle dans ce domaine, je pense que l'intérêt de, de, de défense de Taïwan serait, serait bien moindre à, à, aux, aux yeux des Américains. Il va de soi que les intérêts économiques, et en particulier dans le domaine des semi-conducteurs, est, est, est crucial, central dans les relations américano-taïwanaises. I'm State Senator David Livingston in Arizona. Before I got elected, I was one of the top financial advisors in the country. Arizona is famous for our copper. We have cattle, we have citrus, and now we have the chips.
In the Arizona desert, new businesses are opening up so they can benefit from America's help. The Taiwanese company TSMC is building its first mega factory in the United States. This is the Taiwanese semiconductor plant. Phase one is a $12 billion investment. And, and if it goes well, I think the long-term plans so the next 20 years is to build three of these plants up here in this location. So right there, you're looking at four stories from, from nothing. 18 months ago, it was desert. That's how fast it's going. Economic impact projection in the next 20 years is $38 billion. Because of the plant, because of the other companies that would come here to support it, because of the new apartments, the new houses, that would be the new restaurants, I actually feel personally it's going to be bigger than that. It warms my heart because Taiwanese semiconductors and their people picked us and, they, and we competed against the whole world on where this plant was going to be. This will be their biggest plant they have. And it's here in my hometown, in my district. Um, it makes me very proud, very happy. This semiconductor factory will soon produce five nanometer chips, the latest generation of microprocessors that are currently only being made in Asia. Needless to say, the choice of location was no coincidence. It was in Phoenix, Arizona's capital, that the agreement between the USA and Taiwan was announced in 2020, thanks to active lobbying by the governor of the state. Taiwan Semi is without a doubt this decade's biggest win in Arizona. We showed up to the discussions, we answered the questions, and we pitched what was best about our state. We've got the lowest flat tax in the nation. It, We've eliminated over a thousand regulations that make it a great place to live, work, play, and obviously scale a business. Doug Ducey is a longtime friend of Taiwan. That's why, a month after Nancy Pelosi's controversial visit, the governor is heading to the island. Hello. I'm Doug Ducey, governor of Arizona. It's my great honor to meet with President Tsai. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't dictate to any American where they can and cannot go. If someone wants to go visit our partners in Taiwan, they should feel free in doing so. Taiwan Semiconductor is the best in the world, I think, what we'll be able to have in Arizona will actually be a deterrence to any aggression from China's perspective that they would have on the island of Taiwan. In another victory for the governor, in December 2022, the boss at TSMC welcomed Joe Biden to his factory in Arizona to announce a $30 billion additional investment. Thank you to everyone at TSMC, especially Morris Chang, who founded this company in 1987 and uh, grew it into a global giant. And today, TSMC has announced a second major investment. They will construct a second fab here in Phoenix to build chips, three nano chips. A few weeks later, in the gardens of the White House, it is a historic day for the American economy. Following her return from Taiwan, Nancy Pelosi stands as master of ceremonies. 
Today, Mr. President, with a stroke of your pen, America declares our economic independence, we strengthen our national security, and we enhance our family's financial future. We are the United States of America, a singular place of possibilities. I'm not going to go sign the Ships and Science Act, and once again, I promise you, we're leading the world again for the next decades. Thank you. By signing the Chips and Science Act, Joe Biden gives priority to the protection of American interests. Ready? Got it. Reducing costs, creating jobs, and countering China are becoming key features of Washington's trade policy. $80 billion have been allocated to industry and research, of which $52 billion was just for microprocessors. It is the United States' largest public investment since the Second World War. In the audience, a rather discreet man has been working behind the scenes to reach this outcome. Running a business empire, his company invented the first electronic chip back in 1971. Intel is now the second largest producer of microprocessors in the world. I came into the role as CEO. You know, we, we basically laid out this very simple view. The world needs more geographically balanced, resilient supply chains. And the world now realizes that. That's the essence of the U.S. CHIP DAC, to get more geographically balanced, resilient supply chains. I can't put oil reserves in my country but I can help build fabs in my country. We have to build out. We are coming to you live from Licking County, Ohio. This is the site where Intel is breaking ground for its newest chip manufacturing facility. Intel is going to build a workforce of the future right here in Ohio, a brand new $20 billion campus, 7,000 construction jobs. Please join me in welcoming Intel CEO, Pat Gensler. Oh, we made it. <laughs> this great state of Ohio has this tradition of manufacturing. You all like to build stuff. And that's exactly what we're going to do together. We are going to build the most advanced stuff in the world right here in Ohio. Unfortunately, we produce zero, zero of these advanced chips in America. Zero. And China's trying to move way ahead of us. The United States has to lead the world in producing these advanced chips. And this law makes sure that we will. Intel boss Pat Gelsinger is one of the several entrepreneurs close to the president. In the United States, industrial policy in key economic sectors has a bearing on the interests of the state. The United States do a policy industrial without nationalizing the enterprises comme on a pu le faire en France à un certain moment donné, mais ils interviennent par l'intermédiaire des commandes massives du département d'État. Quand on regarde de plus près dans l'histoire industrielle des États-Unis, on se rend compte, comme dans bon nombre de pays, que le complexe militaro-industriel a joué un rôle majeur dans l'émergence des innovations technologiques. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Let's In Ohio, Intel's $20 billion industrial complex will only take two years to get up and running. This is thanks to the CHIP Act, that is, thanks to the money of the American taxpayer. Semiconductors is an expensive competitive market. I can't make those level of investments without the incentives. So we're looking for offsets of 30 to 40% of a $20 billion the, uh, investment. 
And that's exactly how the CHIPS Act is designed. And as I say to the uh, political uh, leaders, you know, we're not looking for handouts, but if I'm going to make this level of capital investment, it has to be competitive in the world market. Les États-Unis se sont rendus compte que euh, les Chinois arrivant à la frontière technologique avaient auraient une capacité de, de dépasser euh, militairement euh, les États-Unis euh, avec des, euh, des semi-conducteurs qui peuvent intégrer les, les toutes dernières technologies. Et qui aurait pu menacer la suprématie militaire américaine. To combat this, the American reindustrialization strategy is accompanied by punitive and radical measures. American companies are no longer permitted to work with telecoms giant Huawei and SMIC, China's leading producer of microprocessors. In Beijing, this measure is perceived as an aggression. Qichong部分条款限制有关企业在华正常经贸和投资活动具有明显的歧视性。严重违背了市场规律和国际经贸规则，将对全球半导体供应链造成扭曲。所谓芯片和科学法案，中方对此表示坚决反对。Like the United States, States, China is investing billions in the microprocessor sector to no avail. 520美金政府投入不算大。大概我們整個前面的整個提升電路的投入水平,其實中國在在chips上現在幹的是苦活。然後我們雖然進口4000多億 the Chinese government has poured a lot of money into chip making, but it's done so in a very ineffective way. China spends more money importing semiconductors than it does importing oil. Cela fait maintenant près de 40 ans que la Chine investit massivement en perdant de l'argent, des sommes d'argent monumentales sur sur les semi-conducteurs. Et elle, d'une certaine manière, elle a rattrapé, mais elle n'est toujours pas à la frontière technologique. Et les Chinois voudraient bien évidemment être en capacité de dépasser euh, Taïwan, non seulement parce qu'il y a une rivalité entre les deux pays, mais aussi, au-delà de ça, il y a une rivalité vis-à-vis -vis des États-Unis et une volonté d'indépendance euh, technologique vis-à-vis -vis des États-Unis. In response to American sanctions, Chinese semiconductor production has hit an all-time high in recent months. 300 billion chips have been created in the country's factories. Actually,我觉得美国的很多决策是一些非常简化的,或者说是非常有时候在我看来是比较缺乏目标的,或者比较愚蠢的。那我叫姚海平,是这个酷星微电子公司的创始人,董事长CEO。2011年成立了酷星
In China, the world of microprocessors lacks technology, brains, and production capacity. This is the Chinese industry's greatest weakness, which is significantly dependent on foreign microchips. And I worked in China for about two years. I was hired by SMIC as a vice chairman. In 2020, the former executive of Taiwanese company TSMC was recruited by the leading Chinese manufacturer of microprocessors. Professor Chiang now lives in the United States in Silicon Valley. Before I went to China, I heard they are going to put in several hundred billions into semiconductor industry. I think there must be a master plan. After I went there, I found there's no master plan. You think China is a kind of concentrated government? Politically it is, but economically it's not. Because local government have their own funding. They can do whatever they can. People just want to have power. If you look at the aggregate funds that China devotes to shipmaking, it's billions and billions of dollars. But much of that comes from different provincial or local officials, and they all want a facility in their province or their city. So it ends up being very inefficient in terms of how this is spent. As a result, although China's firms are subsidized more than anyone, they've really struggled in the past decade to actually improve their manufacturing capacity relative to other countries. There is a tech war underway. Who will have the technology that leads? Right now, the U.S. has it, but our lead has been slipping. And China certainly wants to have its own indigenous technology that doesn't rely on U.S. or Taiwanese or Korean. Or does China have the means to achieve its ambitions? Will it be able to catch up in less than two years? In this global race for the production of microprocessors, Europe seems overwhelmed, despite speeches by leaders in Brussels. On a délocalisé une très grande partie de ces usines, pas uniquement pour les semi-conducteurs, pour pour un nombre très très important de produits manufacturés. On est dans cette espèce de course que certains critiquent, du reste. Peut-être à juste titre, hein, je ne suis pas loin de le penser moi-même. Maintenant, évidemment, la crise nous a permis d'accélérer les choses, d'avoir cette prise de conscience. Il est temps de reprendre son destin en main pour nous fixer une ambition qui est, à l'horizon 2030, d'être en capacité de produire 20% de la production mondiale sur la planète. Il faut absolument qu'on augmente massivement la capacité de production des semi-conducteurs en Europe. To regain its sovereignty, Europe needs more factories, like this one in the suburbs of Dublin. The most modern factory in Europe is being built in these very suburbs of the Irish capital. Isn't it magnificent? We call this Fab 34. It's a 17 billion euro project two years to build it, a year to put equipment in it and qualify it, and a year to ramp it or so. It's a, it's a multi-year project. By the end of 2023, this plant will produce the latest generation of microprocessors. But appearances are deceptive. Fab 34 is not a European factory. It is owned by the American manufacturer Intel and its boss, Pat Gelsinger. 
Today, we are announcing our European investment program. We envision investing up to 80 billion euros in the EU over the next decade. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen recently said there is no digital without chips. And she is absolutely right. Ladies and gentlemen, a month ago, the Commission presented the European Chips Act. With this the European Act, Commission President appears in Intel's promotional video to publicize its microprocessor and plan. We also want to strengthen our resilience. In total, more than 43 billion euros of public investment, both European Union and national level investment, will support the CHIPS Act until 2030. Incapable of addressing this technological sovereignty problem, Europe has therefore agreed to help American companies. In the trade war between the US and China, Europe seems to be the biggest loser. We had still some producers in the 80s and 90s who have all disappeared and who have been bought by the Americans or even by Asian companies. The Asian countries have failed. What we are trying to do, effectively, to avoid the Europeans, is to secure their provisions today if we had still a geopolitical geopolitical in this industry. However, Brussels can rely on three European manufacturers of microprocessors. Europe actually boasts a major champion in the industry. ASML is a Dutch firm unknown to the general public. This company produces photolithography machines using ultraviolet radiation capable of engraving even the smallest objects. Without ASML, we would not have any microprocessors for our mobile phones. What we are doing, we make a big slide projector. We are providing a machine it actually takes the design of a computer chip and it translates that design onto a carrier. A carrier is the microchip that when you open your phone, you see all these little chips sitting there, you know, that's what we do. It's expensive, but it's like a slide projector. Each of its overhead projectors costs 125 million euros. Only TSMC, Intel, and Samsung are able to afford them. This is a very profitable industry. TSMC, they have announced that they want to spend $140 billion over the next three years. Samsung, similar amount of money. Intel, more than $100 billion. So there's already three, $400 billion by only three manufacturers allocated to build out that capacity. Why would you then, from a risk management point of view, put everything in Asia? You want to distribute this across the globe. It's logical. This is why Intel, it's an American company, comes to Europe. This is why TSMC, Taiwanese company, goes to the United States. The semiconductor industry is an expensive industry to compete in. Building a new facility can cost $20 billion for one plant. So any effort to change the geography of where factories are located is going to cost a lot of money. Now the question is, is it worth it? I believe we have been too dependent on Asia, and I would like to see us reshore our manufacturing. Should countries fund a thriving industry that is riding on the strong wave of demand for microprocessors? Governments need to incentivize, subsidize, those big companies to just start such a big project as a kind of a co-partnership. Governments and manufacturers working hand in hand. In Asia, Europe, and the United States, the chip war has only just begun. Microprocessors have become the main raw material of our digital life. There is no innovation without semiconductors. There is no green without semiconductors, and there is no national security without semiconductors. It's that important to the future. Let's treat it with that priority. You have companies that have developed savoir-faire unique au monde and 
tirent leur épingle du jeu de cette nouvelle donne à l'intérieur euh, qui a été causée par euh, la géopolitique. Et, et, et donc ce sont ces entreprises qui sont en capacité effectivement d'imposer leurs décisions à l'échelle de la planète et, et au gouvernement. This war that is both commercial and political is revealing the limits of globalization. The microprocessor crisis will no doubt further the feud between Chinese and American giants. Will Washington maintain control of its strategy, or will it have to contend with a China committed to resorting to violence in order to close the technology gap? <laughs>